All right. Good morning, John. How are you? Good, Ermis. How are you? How I'm you been? Doing great. I'm doing great. I appreciate you taking the time to join me this morning and talk a little bit about Black Point Cyber. Um, you know, I, I, of course, know the company well, but I'm excited to have you share your story with everybody. I'll start us off by going to the beginning. You know, the security industry has been for a long time uh, a challenge with all the hacks that have gone on and, and it's all been well published, well publicized. What got you into this industry? You know, it's such a crowded field and there's a lot of confusion around the best practices. So what, what drew you to this industry? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I I can't say I had a grand plan to get into this industry. Um, you know, the Cliff Notes version of it was, you know, uh, my brother actually gave me some Cisco books back in the day when I was in college. I was an athlete of Maryland and marketing major, and he said, you know, you should learn networking. So I did that, and I did it by learning hands-on and getting a job, and I was, uh, you know, really wanted to go work for the National Security Agency and they wouldn't give me an interview and I tried and tried and tried and they finally did and I did really well and when I got in there the rest was history and I went right from kind of network engineering directly into cyber security more kind of you know as a bad guy for the right team and uh, you know spent 12 years doing that and you know after spending so many years kind of doing the national security mission uh, I was really intrigued at the idea to take everything, my collective skill set, both in IT, all hands on, right? Because details yep. matter in security. And really, that's all that matters a lot of times. And and so I thought, you know, what better way than to take a run at building a, a software and, and services company and, you know, flip to doing defense? Because uh, many times when you do defense, it really helps being very good at offense. So, how much can you tell us about that time in your life? I mean, I know. You know, you're working for a secretive agency and there's probably a lot you can't yeah. tell us, but what were you, what were you doing that prepared you for what you're doing today? Yeah, I would say, yeah, you know, of course, most of which, you know, we can't talk about, but if we take a step back, big picture, I think a lot of, it has nothing to do really with any specific techniques here and there. There's no you know, special sauce or any magic here in, in hacking. I think what really prepared me is, is first and foremost, having a really deep foundation in IT system administration and networking, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that, to be able to understand how a Windows domain administrator configures, runs a network, the corners he would cut, how he segments and, su and subnets a, a network out. When you go in having a really strong foundation, then everything else you learn is more about how do I break down a specific organization or target to penetrate them. Right. And I think it is, is more those IT fundamentals uh, along with a structured approach to having to um, you know, understand how an organization works, its pressure points for initial access, or um, you know, how to make sense of where you are virtually an environment. And so it's really that kind of collective experience of really strong IT fundamentals. Uh, yeah, talk, talk about with, that for a second, because I've, yeah. I've heard people talk about living off the land once they yeah. break into an organization. What can you describe that? What does that mean? Absolutely. So, so, you know, for the longest time, the only cybersecurity tools that existed out there were ones that were wholly dedicated towards catching malware or the malicious tool set a bad guy uses. Mm -hmm. In my experience, you never have enough exploits, backdoors, or tools to get the job done, right? And before, it was really easy to, you know, trick an antivirus platform. What happened is those got a lot better. But you know what didn't change is IT guys still have to push software remotely. They have to push patches. They have to remotely monitor systems all these hooks that you use to manage a network, if maybe instead of using this hook to see how much disk is being utilized on a server, I could say, give me a listing of all the documents in, in the My Documents folder, okay. right? So what happened is living off the land is really a response to antivirus getting good at catching your malicious tool set. So people said, all right, I'm not gonna make this super tool. 
I'm going to make my tools a little bit simpler. And then I'm just going to prey on the IT guys all day long, steal their creds, act like them. I don't trip the AV. And then it's really hard to actually pick up on good IT administration versus bad. And so living off the land is, is really just using those holes and resources and hooks that are already open to run a network uh, and using them for malicious purposes. So to use an analogy, people can understand. So if we had a castle, we got better at building higher walls and moats with alligators in them and keeping people out. But once they were able to dress up like a waiter and get into the castle walls, they just figured out where the important stuff was maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that's really it. So you're, you're, you're using a normal admin's cred, you're, you know, being mounting shares, connecting to a system. How does that look any different from what the IT guy is doing day to day? Right. right. And so the industry's response to this was, we need to gobble every log in the world and put it in a super system and make sense. Well, it's slow, costs a lot of money. It just didn't work too well. I mean, most every major company you see get, that's been breached runs one of these log systems and they're just not terribly efficient. At, at catching this activity. So it's almost like what you need is when the person's in the castle, every little room they go into, they have to badge swipe. And like that alerts someone on a screen so you have live visibility into what's going on. I, I had actually left, um, left the government in 06. I went back into the commercial world. And that didn't last long, less than a year. And I was back in the government. Uh, I got asked to join kind of a a hot special project and instead of joining as a, a government employee I, I don't know what I was thinking I had no idea what I was doing I was 27 years old I started uh, um, the original Black Point which is more of a government contracting business and in 2014 I got injured in a silly skiing accident and really couldn't work you know on site anymore for an extended period of time uh, and someone's approach bought my uh, my government contracting business, but we were building a lot of technology, network mapping and some cool stuff. And so what we did is we spun that out in 2014 and we spent a few years kind of finishing up our, some of our government work and then head down, spent three and a half years in stealth building out our whole cyber defense platform. So it was really an evolution, right? I got my feet wet running a, running a business kind of in the government space and then pivoted out um, and then really spent a lot of time and money building our tech capability first and foremost. Gotcha. So you started out as a product company, right? With Blackpoint? Absolutely. I mean, I still think of us as a cybersecurity software company, uh, first and foremost. Right. It's just people like eating our food as a managed service. <laughs> right. Well, so, but that was a big pivot for you, right? Getting into the managed service business. It was, it was in, in, you know, the, here's, here's the, how we got into it. You know, we set out to, and basically had this premise, like we see all these tools to run a sock and we just don't think they're actually good at catching a hacker and stopping them in, in real time. So we're going to build the super product. We're going to sell it to a fortune 500 company and they're going to use it in their sock. And, you know, we do no services. Uh, what we found were several things. Most of these Fortune 500 companies didn't actually run a real SOC. They outsourced log management, AV management to a company, and they had a few guys that, you know, uh, just were kind of moving widgets around the board. But we kept seeing a, a strong demand signal from the managed IT service provider market for making our platform cloud-based and then yep. also us just doing all the work. Um, the demand signal was, was strong enough uh, that we step one is we cloudified our whole platform, so made it a full SaaS model. Um, and then step two in 2018 in the fall, uh, we we opened our 24/7 security operations center in, in Maryland and launched our managed detection response offering. And after that, the kind of growth you know kind of went through the roof. So, so managed detection response is kind of the next evolution of outsourced security services. So, and in the term is being abused a lot today, um, you know, uh, but yeah, but really for the most part, outsourced cybersecurity for the longest time was as follows. I'm going to collect your logs and run some automated reporting on them. I'm going to manage your firewall and I'm going to, you know, pump AV alerts into a scene. Uh, 
people kept getting hacked with that, right? But it checked a lot of compliance boxes. Um, and so what came out of that was folks wanted a more uh, meaningful SOC that actually played a role in stopping a breach, not just letting you know you already have an issue and you know now it's a cleanup operation. And our platform is uniquely suited to it. So what MDR really means is you're doing kind of live breach detection. So you're looking at all sorts of indicators of compromise coming in. You're doing active threat hunting. So you're trying to triage, make sense of what's going on. And then the last piece is you have a means to take some form of active resp defensive response. I don't mean hack back or anything like that. Yeah. I mean, stop the malicious event. And it also has to be one where you use prevent technologies to automatically stop something. But everything you do after that assumes your anti-malware prevent fails, right? Because that's where people get into trouble when they don't have anything after the automated tool set. And so, you know, really what we are is a 24 seven sock that will take the initial immediate first steps to stop an event if it happens to get past, you know, your boundary defenses or your antivirus. Where we usually see things is we are monitoring a lot of what you kind of talked about at the beginning, the live off the land activity. So people trying to launch a process on a machine, you know, people doing kind of targeted port scanning, any little indicator we get that's going to trigger us to go threat hunt, our analysts will be all the way at the level of, of looking at every process grade a machine had, you know, which commands were being executed. And then we've built a huge amount of automation and scoring behind the scenes and, and have actually used some machine learning where it actually works well, um, you know, to help us. And, and all of this kind of basically is, makes it really fast for our analysts to make sense and make a call if this is good or bad. Uh, so we do kind of really all that automated enrichment. We know which operating systems are involved, users, exactly what was executed on both sides, what network connections they've made. That's all automatically presented to the analysts, and they have a really simple decision to make after that. Okay. And what does that do for things like false positives that you would normally get in uh, log yeah. files and things like that? Yeah, I mean, we first off, we take that problem off the hands of the customer. So that's that's the the big value prop to the MSP because I, I don't think I answered that question was uh, is really they're able to now offer their customers who are really the Main Street America type companies for the most part, the small medium businesses, a true twenty four seven sock with teeth at a price point they could you know that they can actually afford where they'd never be able to do it. And even the MSPs can't do it on their own. Uh, in a 24 seven operation. So that's the value prop. The MSPs get to serve their customer. They make some margin. We do the work and you know, everyone's happy. Um, uh, yeah, so I mean, that, that's kind of the, the, the value prop there. So false positives to me, that is in the realm of malware detection, right? It's either mm -hmm. malware or not malware, right? And so when you hear false positives, you think of kind of AVs, next gen AVs or endpoint detection response tools. We have a totally different um, kind of categorization system when we deliver our service where we're looking at, at high, con you know, events that have differing levels of consequence. So, you know, you might launch a process on my machine that creates an alert in our system. And you can say that's a false positive. What we would say is, that is a high consequence event that if this is the bad guy doing it can cause catastrophic damage. So we're gonna look at it and verify that. And Cause remember we're, we're catching the live off the land techniques. We're gonna look at that and verify indeed it wasn't a bad guy pretending to be the IT guy and doing something truly gotcha. bad, gotcha. right? So we, we think of, we like a lot of these indicators that some people would call false pauses because that's live off the land, right? You know, if you don't catch that, that's how you get hacked. Right, right. So, so really, you're giving businesses through these MSPs that you sell through um, yeah. the ability to have the best of the best looking at their network 24 by 7 and not worried about hiring an IT guy that has to then 
patch and track and look at a million alerts. Is that safe to say? Absolutely. Yeah, we take that whole kind of breach detection problem off their plate so they can, because I always said, you know, since I've been on both sides of the coin, like the pure IT and the network engineering side and the security, you know, I always said it's hard enough to run a darn network and make it work, let alone run it and secure it perfectly. So right. what I think we allow companies to do is focus on what you do best, right? Which is run the network, keep it stable, available. We'll focus on what we do best, which is to do our breach detection, our threat hunting, our response. And at the same time, so we kind of work together, right? And so, um, but because we're doing it at scale, we have wrote all the software, you know, our cost of goods sold is good. So right. we can deliver it at a price that works for everyone. Uh, the, and, you know, the other part, you know, with kind of the following with your false positive question is these kind of, quote, false positives or what we look at as kind of high consequence indicators, they're also the best look into the hygiene of the network. Almost every single breach we see is totally preventable and it has everything to do with poor IT hygiene. So what we find is the act of looking at this privilege activity going across the network is something in our onboarding phase where we give it to our customers and say, hey guys, you got 200 privileged accounts here. This should be more like 10, right? So it gives them an opportunity to fix some of the hygiene problems up front while we're watching. And that is it. So and you'll get none of that if you're only totally focused on catching the malicious tool set itself. You really need to look at both. And so we'll integrate kind of malicious tool set and AV feeds into our platform so we get that plus the hygiene, plus kind of the live off the land monitoring. Yeah, I, I really love the approach. I think it's innovative and really cool. How's the market reacted? You know, the market, I think, has reacted uh, really well. In fact, we've seen accelerated adoption during the COVID crisis. Um, and we didn't know what we were going to see, to be honest with you. I, you know, yeah. I wasn't sure. We're we going to look at some really lean months here coming up because we were really just hitting this kind of hockey stick phase for us. Um, but if you think about it, for the companies that can operate today, the only reason they can operate is because of their IT systems. Right. So if there is ever a time to double down on your backups, you know, something like what we do in MDR, it's now because without it, you're dead in the water. Um, you know, we're we're assisting with a, well, it will now be a new customer who just had a terrible ransomware event. You know, I mean, worst case scenario, you got everyone remote, then you get a ransomware event, you know, in a, yeah. in a global company. And, um, you know, it's, that's, that's kind of what we're here for to, to, you know, hopefully prevent that from ever even getting to that point. And so yeah. far, if knock on wood, we've had a really good track record. That's great. That's yeah. great. And you're doing this internationally too, right? Yeah, yeah, we have an office over in Qatar in the Middle East. You know, we have uh, major, major customers over there. So we have customers now there, South America, I think some in Central America, Mexico, Europe. Yeah, we're, we're all Asia. We're all over the place now. That's awesome. I'm, I'm pumped to see you guys growing so quickly. How are you personally yeah. holding up during all of this uh, COVID stuff? You know what? Living on the road 50% of the time with three young kids, uh, it's been kind of awesome yeah. <laughs> being home for a little bit, right? It's like, I'm, you know, actually a lot of, you know, we live out in the country and so I've been able to kind of keep up a lot on uh, maintenance around the house, some hairy homeowner stuff. So for me, it's been good. You know, the, I would say the, uh, you know, the business, we're a SaaS cloud company. I mean, we can run from anywhere. Uh, so our you know, delivering yeah. service hasn't changed at all. The BD thing's changed a bit, but me personally, I, I've enjoyed it quite a bit. Good, good. Well, look, I appreciate you taking the time and chatting with me today. This has been great. And uh, keep up the good work and stay healthy. Yeah, it's great chatting with you again, Ernest. I really appreciate it. Thanks, man. Right. Take care.